Today on Newswatch, the vice presidential debate is over. We're bringing you a recap and a look at what the candidates had to say about their faith. Plus, Hurricane Matthew picks up steam as it heads towards the East Coast, while storm victims in Haiti face monstrous floods. And a day to honor God's word in public schools, why children across America are bringing their Bibles to class. And thank you for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. The vice presidential candidates squared off for their first and only debate. It happened at Longwood University in Virginia last night. Both candidates are skilled debaters who represent very different visions for the country and have different ideas on the role of faith in government. White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon has the highlights from Farmville, Virginia. It started as an even matchup, two skilled debaters with similar political experience. But it didn't take long for Senator Tim Kaine to demonstrate how he's prepared to be vice interrupter in chief. I was listening to the avalanche of insults coming out of Senator Kaine a minute ago. The, the, these these were said, Donald. He says, he, oh, hold, hold on a second. It's my Governor. time, Senator. Uh, it is, in fact, the governor's time. He says, this is your two minutes. Thanks. I, I forgive you. Oh, All right. We are moving on now. Senator, if your son or my people, son handled classified information the way Hillary children, Clinton did, they'd be court martialed. That is absolutely false. And you know that. And you know that, Governor. Governor. It's absolutely true. Because the FBI did. As Kaine worked to paint the Trump Pence ticket as out of touch, Pence stayed calm, proving why he's important to the ticket. The pressure to perform was on him after Trump's lackluster week. Then in the final moments of the debate, the candidates were asked about their faith. It's something they both talk about more than their running mates. But when Governor Pence shared his thoughts on the sanctity of life, the gloves came off again. The very idea that a child that is almost born into the world could still have their life taken from them is just anathema to me. And I, and I cannot, I can't conscience about, about a party that supports that. We support Roe versus Wade, and we don't think that women should be punished, as Donald Trump said they should, for making the decision to have an abortion. Donald Trump and I would never support legislation that punished women who made the heartbreaking choice to end a pregnancy. And why did Donald Trump say that? We just that? never would. Why did he say that? Well, look, look, it's, it's, look, he's not a polished politician like you and Hillary Clinton. And so, you know, well, I would don't admit always that's not come out exactly thought. the way you mean. Both men say they take their faith seriously. For me, my faith informs my life. I try and spend a little time on my knees every day. For Kane, a person's faith shouldn't dictate public policy. I try to practice my religion in a very devout way and follow the teachings of my church in my own personal life. But I don't believe in this nation, a First Amendment nation, where we don't raise any religion over the other and we allow people to worship as they please that the doctrines of any one religion should be mandated for everyone. The first rule in vice presidential debates is do no harm. We'll see what the polls say in the coming days. Jennifer Wish on CBN News, reporting from Longwood University. Pence and his wife recorded an interview with Family Talk radio host Dr. James Dobson that airs today. They talked about religious liberty issues in America. Dobson's organization is one of several involved in a legal battle over Obamacare's contraceptive mandate. Dobson told Pence if Clinton is elected and the mandates hold, groups like his could suffer irre irreversible damage. The fine for not uh, complying to this mandate is hundreds of thousands of dollars. We'll close our door. I mean, we're out of business, and we will be if that occurs. What I can tell you is that a Trump-Pence administration will be dedicated to preserving the liberties of our people, including the, the freedom of religion that's enshrined in our Bill of Rights. You can hear this full interview at CBNNews.com. Tim Kaine declined an interview invitation by Dobson. Religious freedom is the newest battle in line in this year's presidential election. Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia takes on the topic in a conference called Faith in the Public Square. CBN News' Mark Martin spoke with the school's president, Dr. Peter Lilback, about how Americans are drifting from the nation's Christian heritage. We are aware that uh, the culture that we've been part of for so many years is beginning to move from being just a post-Christian culture to literally be an anti-Christian culture. They see a commitment to traditional marriage as an expression of hate speech, a belief that genders are divinely given as part of our personhood, 
as some sort of uh, opposition to the norms and standards of an enlightened culture. That entire interview with Dr. Lilback is also posted right here at CBNNews.com. The Atlantic's most powerful storm in a decade is now bearing down on the U.S. Days after hammering Haiti and Cuba, Hurricane Matthew has four U.S. states on high alert. George Thomas has the latest on the storm's potential path. This was the scene in Haiti's southwestern tip, where Matthew first made landfall Tuesday, leaving rivers bloated and many people who live in shacks made of wood or concrete blocks without homes. The entire place is destroyed. Nothing was spared. Nothing. All the trees were destroyed, ripped off. We don't have anything to help us survive. Thousands of people have been displaced as the Category 4 hurricane pounded the nation. With roads blocked and communications down in parts of the country, details are still coming in, but several deaths are already known as rescue workers struggle to reach some of the worst hit areas. Operation Blessing, which has been in Haiti since the 2010 devastating earthquake, has teams prepared to rebuild homes and provide clean drinking water to affected residents. Even before the storm, we started preparing uh, by purchasing uh, building materials to uh, help fix those homes immediately. And we've had a, a, a chlorine a manufacturing machine operating 24-7 since uh, about three, three or four days ago uh, to stock up on, on chlorine. Meanwhile residents in Hollywood, Florida, we're buying a bunch of canned food, a bunch of water, are getting ready. Your batteries and your lanterns and your flashlights. As hurricane and tropical storm warnings are posted along the east coast of the Sunshine State. Whatever happens, even if the eye doesn't go over, I think we're going to get a lot of swell, a lot of wind, and yeah, I think it's best just to stay safe. In North Carolina, Joe Gillis, a fifth generation cotton farmer, is praying for a miracle. He fears Matthew's strong winds and rain could potentially devastate a season's worth of crop. You know, the good Lord's going to do what he's going to do to us, and we're just going to have to keep the faith and hope that by some stretch of the imagination we'll make it through and still be able to salvage some of the crop. In South Carolina, the governor there has ordered more than a million people to evacuate the state's coastline today ahead of Hurricane Matthew. We also anticipate um, averaging about 100 mile an hour winds. So this is something that we want to take very seriously. Haley joined governors of three other states, Florida, Georgia and North Carolina, in declaring states of emergency, as forecasters expect Matthew to hit the southeast U.S. coast later this week. If you're able to leave early and go today, do that. Don't take a chance. Forecasters say it will likely take another day or so to get a better picture of the path and potential impact that Hurricane Matthew could have on the U.S. George Thomas, CBN News. And for more now on what to expect from Hurricane Matthew, we turn now to the AccuWeather Center. Well, I'm very concerned about Hurricane Matthew, still a major hurricane as it has survived uh, the rugged terrain over southwestern Hispaniola and eastern Cuba. Now back over the southwestern Atlantic where water temperatures are very warm. There's not what we call a lot of wind shear, unfavorable winds in the uh, lower, middle, and upper layers of the atmosphere. And as you can see on the water vapor loop, which basically shows you all the moisture, Lots of moisture in place. Notice the blues, that moist axis working its way throughout the Bahamas right into Florida. Dry air and the hurricanes, of course, don't mix. Big time impacts expected today into tomorrow. First, southeastern Bahamas, then tonight to the central Bahamas, and then heading in toward Thursday, the northwestern Bahamas, and potentially even the east coast of Florida as the hurricane warnings are currently in effect, even from Lake Okeechobee eastbound out toward West Palm Beach. I'm expecting a storm surge here of 10 to 15 feet throughout the Central and the uh, northwestern Bahamas rainfall amounts could top 15 inches. So the combination of those two will likely lead to lots and lots of damage. All right, here's what's eventually going to happen with Matthew. High pressure shifts east. Notice its movement here Thursday into Friday. It now shifts off to the north. So now impacts are being felt from the Georgia coastline toward the Carolina coastline. And as we uh, take a look at the track here more so, we're expecting that Category 3 to Category 4 hurricane to maintain intensity all the way through Friday. The Russian military has beefed up its forces in Syria with state-of-the-art air defense missiles. CNN reports the country has brought an additional, more advanced anti-aircraft and anti-missile system into northwest Syria. 
If the missile is set up at a high altitude, it will significantly expand Russian air defense coverage against Syria. U.S. officials said they have developed a concern over the missile, but say the battle for Aleppo will not end quickly. Reporters, uh, reports add the new missile system is not yet operational. The Philippines president has unleashed a new tirade against President Obama, saying the U.S. leader can, quote, go to hell. His statement came in response to U.S. criticism of his deadly anti-drug campaign. It also comes at the same time U.S. and Philippine forces open joint combat exercises today. The president of the Philippines has said, though these will be the last joint military drills with the United States, he has announced plans to scale back on the deep historic ties with the U.S. Today, the six-year-old from South Carolina who died after a teen gunman opened fire at his elementary school is being laid to rest. Jacob Hall's parents invited people to dress up as superheroes to celebrate his life. The district superintendent of schools says there will be a moment of silence this afternoon for Hall. A teacher and another student were also shot. Both are expected, though, to recover. Coming up, taking the Bible to school, students across the country are proudly displaying God's work. This Thursday, more than 300,000 students will allow their light to shine on their school campuses. Bringing Your Bible to School Day is a one-day event, and it's completely student-directed. Its purpose is to empower students to express their faith in a respectful way that shows the love of Christ. It is backed by the Alliance Defending Freedom and Focus on the Family. Earlier, our Mark Martin spoke with Focus on the Family's Candy Cushman about this event. You have more than 300,000 students going to school with their Bibles on Thursday. Can you explain the purpose of this movement? Yes, well, just in a nutshell, this is a religious freedom initiative for students nationwide, kindergarten to college. And they are just gonna be celebrating their religious freedom and uh, sh talking with their friends, sharing God's hope, uh, just by taking a simple action, just taking their Bibles to school and talking about why they're doing that and sharing about what they believe in it with their friends before and after class. What do you hope the students who participate in Bring Your Bible to School Day will learn from this experience? Well, you know, unfortunately, we here at Focus have heard from families and also I, I'm sure your audience has seen all the news headlines about students being told things like, you know, you can't do something simple like just bow your head and pray before lunch or have your Bible out at your desk during free reading time. And that's just not correct. That's not correct under our Constitution or our First Amendment. And so we want students to understand what their rights are and just to have a visual celebration of their freedoms and a reminder that they can, you know, share freely about their deeply held uh, religious beliefs. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Some parents may wonder if they are within their rights to send their kids to school with a Bible or even express their faith at school. What's your answer for them? Yes, I would just reassure parents that uh, students have tremendous rights to do something simple like bring their Bible to school, just like they would, you know, with any other favorite book that they have and be able to read that during free time or even talk about it during lunch with their friends. And these rights have been backed up by several decades of court decisions, even up to the Supreme Court. So this is well established. And I think the basic thing to remember, because we hear a lot of phrases thrown around, you know, like separation of church and state. But the fact is that the students are not the state. They are not speaking for the government. They are speaking as private individuals expressing their personal faith. So there's a big difference and they have um, a strong right to do that. There's a lot of concern about religious freedom in today's climate. How do you prepare the students to handle negative reactions from other students or maybe even the school itself? Right. Well, we do encourage them to remember that this is all about having conversations. It's not about confrontation. So, you know, you know, it is wise to expect challenges, but to always remain respectful and, you know, that that person in front of you is not going to remember everything that you said, but they are going to remember whether you reflected what you believe in this case that, that uh, Christ loves people and was willing to die for them. And so they need to feel Christ's love from you um, the love of Jesus. And that's what the students want to do is demonstrate that. Um, so we encourage them to remember that, just that it's about conversations. 
And then if they are challenged on their basic right to participate, you know, to put a poster on a wall or have their Bible at their desk during free time, um, that they can remain respectful. They can show their educator a memo that we provide on their rights to do that that has been put together by the Alliance Defending Freedom. And then if they're still told no, we just encourage them to, you know, respect that uh, uh, education official's authority, but then they can call a hotline that we have available. We have attorneys standing by ready to help students on this day. So uh, there's a hotline and an online form they can fill out later if they had trouble at school and they don't feel like their rights were respected. Candy, how can Christians get more involved in sharing their faith on a regular basis? <clears throat> well, you know, we've seen studies that youth are stronger in their faith when they're able to engage with it like this. And so, you know, participating in events like this and initiatives and being unafraid to engage with the Bible and articulate what you believe is a key part of that. And not only does it empower them in their own faith and strengthen them to be able to articulate what they believe in, um, but it also helps protect the religious freedom of students, you know, that are going to be walking into those schools after them. So, we do encourage parents that it's it's just healthy for students to um, be encouraged to have conversations, to engage in civic, uh, you know, opportunities and events like this whenever they can. And so, bring your Bible to school day is a key opportunity for that. Plus, it's responding to the Great Commission in the Bible. That's for sure. That's right. I mean, ultimately, Christians want to share God's love because that love has changed their life, and so they want to communicate that to others. And, and I do just want to mention that, you know, a lot of answers to concerns people may have or questions or, ha you know, fears about what uh, what happens if their rights are challenged. Um, they can listen to, to students tell their own stories about that and get information at our website, bringyourbible.org. Okay. Thanks so much. Candy Cushman of Focus on the Family. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It is the unmistakable sound of the Jewish New Year. And there's a big reason why. The story behind the shofar is coming up next. Biblical fall holidays are underway. They begin with Rosh Hashanah, known as the Jewish New Year. But the Bible gives the holiday an entirely different meaning. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell shows us why it's so important. Rosh Hashanah literally means head of the year, the new year. But biblically, it's much more than that. In the book of Leviticus, it's called Yom Teruah, the day of the blowing of trumpets or ram's horn, the judgment day. The only commandment during Rosh Hashanah is actually to hear the sound of the shofar. Okay. And so everybody gathering in the synagogue to hear the sound of the shofar. It's something that people connect to their soul to hear the sound of the shofar. The piercing sound of the shofar is meant to remind the hearers to repent of their sins and to make things right with their brothers and sisters. The rabbis say that reconciliation with God and man confounds the enemy. A shofar is a musical instrument made from a horn. This is the oldest musical instrument. And the Jewish Orthodox who have a committee to hear the sound of the shofar during the New Year. The, our uh, ju judgment day. As part of a two-family business, Eli Ribach is a third-generation shofar maker. The process is uh, poly grinding, polishing, then we drill an uh, open uh, mouthpiece. This is uh, quick, but it's a lot of experience and a lot of hand uh, work because each horn is a different size, different thickness, so you have to be experienced to make a good shofar. The ram's horn is used as the traditional shofar because when Abraham showed his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac, God provided a ram to be used in his place. It's actually, all type of horns are kosher except of a cow. That's because the Jewish people don't want to remind God of the time Israel worshipped the golden calf in the wilderness. Besides the distinctive tones of the different horns, there are three different blasts sounded. The shofar is blown in synagogues and at the Western Wall each morning for a month before the holiday to give plenty of time for repentance. You and I both know that uh, we need a lot of reminders in our daily life to repent, to think of the things of God. It's like an alarm clock for the soul. Reebok says it's not just Jewish people who blow the shofar. 
We sell the shofar all over the world. We sell it to Jewish, to Christian, uh, Messianic people, evangelist people. Rosh Hashanah is the feast of the seventh month, but in Jewish tradition, represents the new year. At the coronation of the kings of Israel, the shofars would blow. They would announce the new king or they would announce the coming of the king. Oftentimes in the Christian world, shofars are blown throughout the entire year. But in Judaism and in Jewish practice, those shofars are only blown for a very limited time throughout the year. During this time, the month of Elul and Rosh Hashanah. Boaz Michael, founder of First Fruits of Zion, says that's a foreshadow for those who believe in Yeshua, Jesus. And they tell us something, they're speaking to us, they're reminding us of something. And one of the things they're reminding us of is the creation of the world, the coming of the King, King Messiah one day at this time, uh, the coronation of his kingdom here on earth. This is what the shofar is to remind us of. And it's, it speaks to us every day when we hear that sound. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. An unmistakable sound and a moving one indeed now that we know the reason behind it. Stay with us. We're coming right back with more of CBN Newswatch. It's time now for your Wednesday word, and today's word is perfection. Remember, God isn't looking for that, and hold fast to this confession. My flaws don't make me a failure because my God sees beyond them. He is more concerned with my availability and my sincerity. With that word, be sure to make this a wonderful Wednesday. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about, and you can always find them at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do it on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Make it a wonderful Wednesday.